it's a pleasure to welcome it's a pleasure to welcome professor barry sanders uh, for the joint icts isc colloquium today on the sure. subject of creation and use of quantum entanglement and uh, before that here is something for you <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much i will give a formal introduction okay so uh, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Barry Sanders uh, for this uh, ICTS IIC joint colloquium. Uh, Barry Sanders is the ICOR Chair of Quantum Information and Director of the Institute for Quantum Information Science at the University of Calgary. Of late, he's also the Chenren, is that Chenren Professor at the University of Science and Technology of China, as well as an adjunct professor of quantum information science in Macquarie University, Australia. Before moving to Calgary in 2003, he was professor and head of physics at Macquarie University in Sydney. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society, the Optical Society of America, and Institute of Physics in the UK. Uh, Barry is especially well known for seminal contributions to theories of quantum limited measurement, uh, highly non-classical light, practical quantum cryptography, and optical impl implementations of quantum information tasks. His research interests are in quantum information, quantum optics, quantum control, and quantum transport in biomolecules. Uh, Barry has received several awards over the years, notable among them being a senior fellowship of the CIFAR program on quantum information processing, Canadian Institute for Advanced research, Scientific Research, Faculty of Science Award for Excellence in Research at the University of Calgary, and Fellowship of APS, Optical Society of America, and Institute of Physics, UK. He's also on the editorial board of Physical Review A, so don't annoy him. Okay. On a, on a personal note, uh, this is Barry's third visit to Bangalore. He crosses the Bangalore roads better than I can, and, and I'm not joking here. He's confident that he'll be able to drive a car on Bangalore roads. So apart from physics reasons, we should definitely invite him back soon and test this hypothesis. So over to you, Barry. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Great pleasure to be back here in Bangalore. Yeah, we could, we could rent a van, and I'll take everybody. Get a bus, I'll drive everybody along. But at one point in my life, I actually was a truck driver as a student. I, got I drove up to 12 tons, so I, I can drive. <laughs> uh, OK, now, um, so it's a pleasure to be here. And I prepared the talk, and I've tried to bear in mind here that there's a dual purpose of this talk. One is the colloquium uh, here to, to physics, but also it's part of a workshop on uh, entanglement from gravity going on at ICTS. And I'd, and, uh, I'd like to thank both ICTS and IASC for inviting me over. Um, and I'm going to try to pitch this talk so it, it's reaching the full audience here, which means that um, I'm going to try to go through conceptual points, but I'm also going to try to be clear on important aspects of entanglement. Um, so en entanglement, certainly at this workshop I'm at for three days, entanglement is very important. And then there are certain concepts that are uh, crucial, and some of them are subtle, and, uh, and we have to think about them. OK, and then, uh, OK, so that's creating and using entanglement. Let's get started. This is the outline. This is a picture of the, so I'm, as you heard, I didn't do saying, um, I'm University of Calgary, so I'm there 80% of the year. And then I'm at the University of Science and Technology of China, Shanghai branch. This is uh, Shanghai Pudong on a clear day. I've never seen a clear day, <laughs> but so I think it's photoshopped. Um, but this, so these are the two cities I'm in. Uh, so what we'll try to cover first, I'll just give you an introduction to entanglement from a historical perspective. Then we'll go on to foundational issues. One slide is going to be technical, mathematical. Um, it's not essential for subsequent slides. So if you don't feel like comfortable with technical math, you can sleep for a, a minute while I get through that slide. And it won't be crucial later on. But it is important for some of the people here, I feel. Um, then we're going to go to the idea of bipartite entanglement. So entanglement is a broad concept. Almost everybody, when they talk about entanglement in, for use in uh, quantum information, gravity, everything, is really in the context of bipartite. It's the idea that you take your system, you cut it in two, and then you look at the two parts being entangled with each other. So we'll talk about the bipartite entanglement. Then I'll get to operational entanglement. So there's a mathematical notion of entanglement. And then operational entanglement deals with um, preparing it, verifying it, uh, it's both mathematical and physical, but for 
for a person like me who works in quantum information, having entanglement's not enough. It needs to be operational. We have to at least conceive of how to know it's there, what it is, how to use it. And then once we get that straight, we'll go on to tasks. And then I'll finish off with a movie I made a few years ago. Uh, it's an animated movie, and it just shows how quantum teleportation works. So we'll end with a few minutes of an animated movie showing teleportation, which is kind of the epitome of what entanglement or bipartite entanglement can deliver. If anybody's got questions while I talk, you're welcome to interrupt and ask. So I'm, I'm happy for interruptions. OK, so I made a list of notions that I'd like you to bear in mind as we go through what entanglement is. Um, the uh, essence of entanglement really ties together two concepts in quantum mechanics. One is the superposition principle, the idea that uh, there are waves. Um, so we can treat the system by a wave equation. Schrodinger's equation is a wave equation. And second, it's the tensor product structure. Mathematically, the tensor product structure refers to the idea that we have multiple particles. So if you have an atom with many electrons, or you have a, uh, atoms in a gas, all these things where we have multiple particles, um, mathematically, we call that a ten we re represent it in a tensor product structure. And the combination of the two implies entanglement. And this, so in the early days of quantum mechanics, the notion of complementarity was that, um, that energy and matter has a dual property. It can behave like particles and like waves. And it depends on what you do to the system to see the wave-like or particle-like properties. So that was complementarity. Um, and Niels Bohr did a great job of elucidating that. And then soon after, the tensor product structure became uh, evident, that once you say a particle could be like a matter or wave, the next question is, what can two particles be like? And so two particles um, can exhibit entanglement. And this is something that disturbed Einstein. So the Einstein-Podolsky-Rosen paradox emerges by considering uh, strange properties. I'll talk about it. But strange properties about um, entanglement. And after that, uh, Schrodinger um, devised the famous Schrodinger-Cat paradox, where he showed that even the notion of life and death is uh, uh, kind of mysterious once you accept quantum mechanics as a foundation and entanglement. OK, um, the next thing I want to tell you is ubiquity. That means it's everywhere. So the ubiquity of entanglement tells us that if we deal with pure states, you can then easily show that the set of all pure states have zero measure on the set of all states. That means that if you picked a random uh, pure quantum state, just pick it randomly, you're 100% likely that it's entangled. So the idea that entanglement is mysterious doesn't affect the fact that entanglement is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. So entanglement is the norm. Everything is entangled. Unfortunately, almost all entanglement is useless. That's why we'll get to bipartite entanglement, that it's, um, it's only special kinds of entanglement that we care about. OK, um, the next thing is I think of it as fragile. That if, I, so I said entanglement is everywhere, but any ignorance we have about the state we're dealing with makes it uh, disappear. So mixed states are, uh, and I'll get into it more later, but mixed states are a mixture of pure states of some random distribution. And so if you calculate the entanglement of typical states, when you have some ignorance about the state that you've got, there's no longer entanglement in the system. Okay? So if you know everything about your state, it's 100% likely to be entangled. If you don't know just a little bit, it's very likely to be uh, not entangled. OK, entanglement's important for the mystery, um, the measurement paradox, the many worlds interpretation that came out in 1957 by Hugh Everett III. Um, you know, one of the resolutions of the measurement paradox was to try to uh, replace measurement by entanglement. Everything is entangled with everything, and measurement is an entangling operation. We, in fact, use that in, in the quantum computing setting I won't go into. Um, but entanglement is used both to generate or to elucidate the mysteries in quantum mechanics and also to show how the mystery uh, and also to resolve mysteries. Um, another one is the realism. I mentioned Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. And so, uh, and I'll tell you more in a moment, but the idea that they had is that nature should be 
satisfy a property of local realism. Information can't travel faster than the speed of light. And, um, and there shouldn't be, pro the universe should not be probabilistic. This ultimately led to Bell inequalities. And so creating entangled states is essential if we want to probe um, the question of, that Einstein posed, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen posed. Uh, if we want to probe it, entanglement becomes a resource that we're able to probe whether quantum mechanics is complete or incomplete in the Einsteinian sense. The resource side, which is where my own field is, is uh, dominated by bipartite entanglement. And that's the idea that we can use it for quantum computing, quantum teleportation, quantum dense coding, uh, and so on, uh, quantum cryptography. So it becomes a resource. And in fact, this resource can be created and destroyed. It could be uh, put, converted to various forms. So um, bipartite entanglement can be, it is a resource in computing the same way that we care about memory, we care about uh, um, gigaflops, you know, how fast a gigaflops, teraflops now, how fast computers operate. This is a resource that we can put into a computing paradigm. And finally, um, there's the concept of monogamy of entanglement or limitations to sharing useful entanglement. And this topic of, of monogamy of entanglement um, is uh, really, uh, it, it, it kind of captures part of the mystery of, of, of entanglement. It says that it can't be shared very far. You know, the idea, the idea is that somehow entanglement is, uh, can't be shared out to too many parties. This one um, has been studied for some time, but lately this question has received a lot of publicity because of the famous, very active research on the black hole firewall paradox. So there's this paradox in um, uh, quantum gravity uh, that arises out of uh, considering this issue. So these are, this is kind of a list of motivations why, why we should think about entanglement. And I tried to capture in some way or another all the essences. So I hope that's a complete list. OK, so let's just try to understand a bit of the history for it. Um, so Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen back in 1935 considered a system of two particles that are created in such a way you could think about a nuclear decay process with two correlated particles flying apart. But the correlated particles are more than correlated, they're entangled. And they considered the following. Consider a particle going this way, particle going that way, and then measure something about this particle, like its spin. And the spin has two uh, parameters that characterize it. And then somebody over here is measuring this particle. In the einstein podolsky rosen original formulation, they talked about position and momentum. But later, David Bohm uh, showed a, a spin-related version that was kind of nicer. It was a compact Hilbert space description. And then it was Bell who used Bohm's description to construct the Bell inequality. So they consider measuring the first of two entangled particles. And then they show that the second state of the second becomes indeterminate. So the idea is that um, it depends that it, what you measure on one side, what you're going to get on the other, the correlations will be good if the two measurements are somehow synced together or locked together, otherwise not. So they claimed that this indeterminacy, um, which highlights quantum mechanical indeterminacy, uh, is not acceptable. Uh, and it's not acceptable because um, nature should be somehow deterministic. You know, that's what Newton's laws have, et cetera. Newton's laws, Maxwell, everything is deterministic. So they were disturbed by that. And then they said, well, there's only two ways to explain this. Either there's an instantaneous interaction. Doing something to one particle affects the other. Or there's some pre-existing hidden information. And Einstein, as the uh, discoverer of special relativity, said the first is sacrosanct. And so then there has to be hidden information. And hidden information can't be built into quantum theory, and therefore, um, the theory must be incomplete. That's kind of the argument. Now, the incompleteness argument, um, in the early days after this, it, it was regarded that you know, quantum mechanics is somehow mathematically complete, but not complete in the sense of being deterministic. It was later, I'll get to it, the Bell inequalities, where there was a realization that if it was incomplete, if it were incomplete, it would be testable. So uh, the idea here that it's incomplete, it was later on um, that Bell realized that even the question of completeness was a testable proposition. In the early days, if you start going through the old literature, it seems like 
the incompleteness question was regarded as only philosophical. Wolfgang Pauli wrote a bit about that. Okay, um, now uh, Schrodinger introduced entanglement. In fact, Schrodinger called it uh, Verschränkung, which kind of means like an interlocked grasp. So, and then he himself translated it to English as entanglement. His physics was much better than his German-English translation skills. So the word, in, the word Verschränkung is what he was thinking of, and the word entanglement isn't quite what he had in mind, um, but that's what we call it now. But in German, it's still got that word. So it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of more of an intertwinement. Than, entanglement, you, you think of like a rope all tied up in knots or something. Entanglement, I always think of as tangled in some way, messy. Um, so it's not a great word. This uh, cartoon illustrates the um, uh, Schrodinger cat paradox that emerges out of this line of thinking. And so in this case, um, Schrodinger, whoops. Uh, yeah, in this case, um, Schrodinger considers a cat in a box. There's a poison gas. The poison gas is triggered by a nuclear decay. And here I've depicted an alpha particle decay. So according to quantum mechanics, nuclear decay, so an, an alpha particle decay, you can think of it as a doubly charged helium, so a helium nucleus bouncing around inside a finite barrier, a finite spherical barrier, and then it's going to tunnel out. But the quantum tunneling is not some event that occurs at a predetermined moment. The quantum tunneling is given by um, uh, a superposition, right? So the particle is in some superposition of decayed and not decayed. If the particle being triggered causes a poison gas to kill the cat, then if the particle hasn't decayed, the cat's alive. And if the particle decays, the cat inhales the poison gas and dies. Everything takes place in an opaque box, so an observer doesn't know what's going on. And the best description that the observer can write down without worrying about philosophical macroscopicity arguments, so you know, just on this level, the idea is that you have an undecayed particle and a live cat, a decayed particle and a dead cat, and they're in a superposition state. So this um, idea that a cat can be entangled with the state of the particle that's supposed to trigger the poison gas was Schrodinger's objection to entanglement that even the idea of life and death um, are somehow obscured by quantum mechanics. So these were early considerations. Uh, and you can see they're disturbing. So they've motivated a lot of research in foundations of quantum physics. Now. Uh, I mentioned to you that David Bohm converted the einstein podolsky rosen argument from position momentum to one of spin. And then uh, Bell, John Bell, in 1964, had a paper out um, that considered mathematically a correlation. So he takes the idea of local realism very seriously. Let's talk about two parties, Alice and Bob. Alice has some measuring instrument. If she's looking at a spin, she can orient her instrument in three dimensions. So A is simply a vector that points in three-dimensional space. Bob ha is far away. He's doing his operations space-like separated. So Alice and Bob are doing their thing in a way that they're forbidden to communicate with each other. The instruments can't communicate space-like separated. So they're causally disconnected. And then Alice has her operation. She orients her instrument to A. Bob orients to some angle B or some uh, unit vector b. And then um, we allow a hidden variable. So we say we take this space-like separation, plug in a hidden variable lambda, and this is the hidden, hidden variable, or it could be many variables, some hidden variable of, uh, that Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen refer to. And so um, Bell considered a correlation. Uh, so the correlation here with a b is the probability of getting a detection event. And then um, it's set up so that the result can only be plus or minus 1. If you get a particle with spin, it's either up or down. So this reflects that the spectrum of measurement is up or down. And then what Bell proved is if he considered three angles, A, B, and C, of three parties, he proved an inequality. And his inequality demonstrated that, um, that the einstein podolsky rosen concept of incompleteness was a testable proposition. Um, his inequality we don't see anymore. So we refer to Bell inequalities often, but almost nobody has ever seen 
this Bell inequality. The, so this is the Bell inequality. And then people say, we're testing Bell inequalities. But we're not. We're testing these inequalities, which are slightly different. There are a couple of problems with Bell's inequality in a practical sense. One is there are three different parties. But more importantly, his proof doesn't allow detector inefficiency. So once we start to consider practical implementations, the, um, the reality that detectors are inefficient, things are imperfect, uh, can't in an obvious way be built in. So um, he did that in 1964. Several years later, Clauser, Horn, Chimney, and Holt started to explore how to test um, a variation, test a Bell inequality in a practical sense. So they constructed an inequality I write as S. And now consider Alice and Bob. So there'd be a set of measurements. Alice sets her instrument with angle A, not angle, but orientation A. Bob sets his at orientation B. They perform a measurement of the rate of events reflecting that correlation. They repeat the experiment. Alice keeps the same setting. Bob changes his. Then they do it again where Alice goes to her new setting. Bob returns to his original. And then they subtract the correlation that um, we have, uh, that they subtract the correlation where Alice and Bob both pick the new settings. And then, they and then you get that quantity. Every experiment I know of to date has uh, been using the Bell, Clauser, Horn, Chimney, Holt inequality. And there's some assumptions that go into it. Um, so one important assumption is known as the fair sampling hypothesis. It turns out that when, when Alice, is, Alice might not see a particle, and Bob does, or vice versa. In this inequality, those events are discarded. So every time one particle goes click and the other's missing, it's ignored. So it's a very big assumption that says that uh, um, it says somehow nature is fair. It will delete randomly in a uniform fashion with no malice the cases where there are single events. Um, if you ac accept that assumption, um, and this is often referred to as the loophole, so that fair sampling hypothesis is a loophole, um, you find that classically there's a bound of 2, and quantum mechanically there's a bound of 2 root 2. If you're a logician, you'll see that the bound is 4. So it's an interesting issue. Um, if you do the experiment and you exceed 2 and you trust the fair sampling hypothesis, then you've uh, violated local realism, falsified Einstein's um, argument. And then you're bounded above by 2 root 2, but there is a notion, some people might have heard of uh, Popescu, Rorick, Warlick, Warlick, um, or PR boxes, uh, which are non-local boxes. So you can, in principle, violate 2 root 2. But there's a proof known as Cyrilson, Cyrilson's bound, which shows that in quantum mechanics, that has to hold. So we know that holds for quantum mechanics. But there's a non-local, there's see, people now call this the non-local box world. So there's a concept of a universe where this is broken, and there's non-local boxes you can pick up and use to do strange things. And all kinds of, of amazing things happen. Uh, even on the computer science side, for example, communication complexity, you get a collapse of hierarchies, all kinds of weird stuff. So it's, it's fun. It's just probably not the universe we live in. Um, OK, so there's this concept. And then soon after, Clauser and Horn got together, and they figured that they didn't really like the fair sampling hypothesis. And so they allowed for the singles. That's the, the occasions when Alice gets a photon and Bob doesn't, or vice versa. And so using their notation of infinity, referring to removing the polarizer, so they want to do the experiment not just with settings A and B, but they also um, do the experiment where one of them removes a polarizer and gets events, and the other one can remove a polarizer, and they both remove it. So the detectors are still there clicking, but they put in these events. And then they find that they get an inequality with a lower bound minus C of infinity infinity, and then some combination of events with and without the polarizers, and that is bounded above by 0. That Clauser-Horn inequality is, this year, a major effort by at least three groups I know, possibly more, who are racing to do it. So it turns out that we've known since, for decades, that the detector efficiency has to be 82.5% to be able to perform experiments that will violate that inequality with space-like separated Alice and Bob. And the detectors are just out last year. And so there are certain groups who have now put their 
students to work 24 hours a day in special places to try to gather enough data to violate that. And, and a lot of people think that once that's done, that's probably a Nobel Prize coming out on that. So this is, in, in, in the community I'm in anyway, um, we're kind of waiting day by day to see if that inequality is violated. And if it is, then this is taken, uh, this is taken almost universally. I mean, there's still other loopholes one can find. But for almost everybody, if this can be violated, then we feel like we've actually reached the point that the Einstein-Podolsky or the Einsteinian local realism is truly falsified. So that's a big deal going on right now. And it's related to entanglement and non-locality. OK, and I, I should point out 82.5% efficient detectors and the dark count rate has to be low. So make. <laughs> you want me to predict on, I'm being recorded, who's going to get it? Um, no, yeah, I, so I, I'll tell you later who I think. Uh, but it depends who sees it, right? <laughs> so, uh, OK. Um, this is a concept of how the experiment worked. I was waving my arms around explaining, but let me show you better. There's a source in the old uh, Bohm-Bell concept. It's a nuclear decay process that generates two particles. In modern experiments, um, it's a two-photon creation event by parametric down conversion. So a photon will go this way, and a photon will go that way. And the two photons are uh, entangled with each other. Then they go through polarizer, uh, polarizing instruments. These are the A and B settings. To be complete, we have a detector here, a detector there, there, and there. In the Clauser Horn vision version, this can be removed. And this is a counting module. And Alice and Bob are space-like separated. So they each perform their measurements fast enough and are complete before any malicious instrument could tell the other what's going on. So it has to be a very fast event. And it looks like this year all the technology is in place. So there's, everything, is, everything exists now that it's just a matter of time, we believe, for it to be violated, unless, of course, Einstein was right. <laughs> and then it won't be violated. Um, OK, so that gives you the idea of the experimental Bell inequality test. And it also gives you an idea that the entanglement is a resource needed to be able to demonstrate this violation. OK, this is the mathematical slide I warned you about. I just want to get some mathematics straight for those people who are, um, again, there's, as I said, it's a dichotomous group here. I want to make sure, especially talking to people working with entanglement related to gravity, that we get some notions straight, at least in the way I'm going to talk about it. So this is one technical slide that's mathematical physics, and then we'll move away from that again. So I'm going to use some various terms here. It turns out that to get quantum mechanics right, it's nice to talk on an intuitive level. But in order to get things like entanglement, violations, resources, and all that right, we need to use, be very, very careful in our language. So I'm going to use the term operator. And strictly speaking, for those who know, it's a trace class operator in L2 of R. It's a Banach space. It operates on a Hilbert space. And so that's what an operator is. The Hilbert space can uh, represent the space of pure states that I mentioned earlier. The space has a norm on it, which is known as the trace norm. So given an operator, uh, the theta, theta dagger theta, take the square root, take the trace of that. That's the norm. That norm corresponds to the square root of the sum of the squares, mod squares of the singular values. The singular values are, you can take an operator represented as a matrix, do a transformation. So it's some matrix times a diagonal matrix times another matrix. That's known as the singular value decomposition. And then the singular values fit in like that. So if we know the singular values, it's trivial to calculate the norm of an operator. And that becomes important for distance. So in, in the real world, we never do things exactly right. So if we want to know how off we are, we have to have a norm to calculate um, imprecision. And then there are bases. We work with the Hilbert space basis. I just write that as Ketz. This is Dirac notation. So there's some set of countable states. Um, here, so countable states, typically with, like, with spin, there's two states. So typically, it's finite, but we have to worry about infinite as well. The tensor product structure I mentioned, which is, reflects the multiple particles. Remember that entanglement, I told you early on, entanglement is about superposition principle and have more than one particle. Mathematically, that's the tensor product. And so tensor product structure has a multiplication sign with a circle around it. Uh, of different Hilbert spaces. That multiplication with a circle around it is telling us that we don't just join things together, but we join it together in a way that the norm 
that this concept of norm carries forward naturally, et cetera. OK, we have a representation. I'll be writing states as the Greek letter rho. And rho can be expanded in terms of the basis states. This is the basis state for the Hilbert space, tensor product. And then this is called a bra. This bra is the adjoint of the ket. And so we can write rho, which lives in L2 of R in that fashion. We can diagonalize rho. And we diagonalize rho. We can think of it as a mixture of pure states. So remember what I told you early on. Pure states, if you pick pure states at random, they're 100% likely to be entangled. There exists non-entangled states, but with zero measure. If we um, diagonalize like that, then we get a probability distribution. So we have the sum of probabilities of those different pure states. And those probabilities, unless a pure state corresponds to one of these being 1 and all the rest being 0, otherwise, and then we can write the state as just one of those. But that's got zero likelihood. And therefore, the ubiquity of, of uh, entanglement disappears when we mix. OK. Um, now, another important thing of pure states is what we call purification. So all mixed states, we believe, um, can be represented as pure states in a larger space. John Smolin at uh, IBM uh, in the United States uh, coined the term church of the larger Hilbert space. So when I use the term belief, the belief term is, is almost literal, because John Smolin said that you know, if you believe that every state can be purified in some sense, so here's the pure state. This is known as a partial trace. So we throw away, we ignore part of the information, and that leads to the mixed state. And this idea is not an axiom of quantum mechanics, but it could be. So we just believe that to be true. We use this a lot in proofs. So when we try to prove relations related to entanglement, we often do this purification and work in an, in, in an easier space to deal with that. I think in, in some of the stuff I'm hearing at this entanglement from gravity workshop, where everything is a pure state, um, so in my concept of the world, nothing is pure uh, because it's got zero measure. Um, but in some sense, if the universe is in a pure state, then I try to think of it as being a purification of what I know. So I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of wrestling. I come from a background where pure states are not sensible to talk about. And uh, I'm sitting in a community where it is. And so I kind of reconcile it through that argument. OK, and finally on this slide, the final mathematical step is the entropy. And the entropy, um, there's a term I've heard a lot about uh, today and yesterday at this workshop, which is the, uh, uh, using the von Neumann entropy. I thought I would put it down here. And so um, the entropy, the von Neumann entropy of state is mathematically the negative of the trace of the density matrix times the log of the density matrix. But if we diagonalize it in this fashion, then it's equal to the sum of p log p. And those are the probabilities of the different pure states mixing up the mixed, uh, mixed state. And this is exactly the Shannon information. If people know about Claude Shannon, who is the, is the father of information theory. And so if you do information theory, channel capacities, et cetera, this uh, quantity tells you channel capacity. And uh, so the von Neumann entropy is a straightforward generalization of the Shannon information of a system. OK, that's it. Yeah. Is the purification unique? Uh, no. <laughs> no. We can discuss more later. OK, now let's go to the bipartite entanglement. You've got the mathematics. I'll speak. I'll use mathematical terms, but I'll also explain uh, as well at a level that you don't need to know the mathematics of it. Um, but the idea, the idea of entanglement is simply the issue of whether a state is separable. So entanglement is the complement of separability. So consider what we do is we take a state, and the state can be over many particles. right? So imagine an atomic gas. You have a gas of atoms, many atoms, and there's a state representing the whole thing. The separability refers to the idea of, can we cut the gas into two, have the state, um, and then can we write the overall state as a probabilistic mixture of products of states on the left and the right? So the 
Entanglement, strictly speaking, is just non-separability. If we can do that in any partition, it's separable. And if not, it's entangled. And the way, the way it looks here is um, that the space of separable states is written in such a way. So remember the gas on the left and the right. This would be the gas on the state of the gas on the left, state of the gas on the right. If we write that joint state with some probability, and we can sum in a convex way, so the PIs are all numbers between 0 and 1. If we can do that, then there's no entanglement. So the question of entanglement is, given a state, can it be written in that form? So in order to identify entanglement, we're asking the question of, does it take that form? And that question becomes very interesting. It's interesting to ask whether it's computable. If it is computable, it's interesting to ask whether it's efficient. And if it's efficient, it's interesting to ascertain whether it's even doable with current technology. Is the experiment good enough? Is the theory good enough? Is the computer big enough to be able to tackle it? So this whole question of, of knowing that something is entangled itself has sparked research in the computer science side. Um, OK, now here I'm going to give you a quantity that I think, so this is not um, universally uh, it's not universal. Everybody prefers this direction. But I like this way of thinking about entanglement. That, um, that first of all, I'll tell you, so there's something known as the kullback leibler divergence. And this is a very important concept in information theory that has to do with the question of, um, you know, given that you have some probability distribution of events and you pick, you've got the wrong one, how do you decide, how do you, how, how do you determine how wrong um, how can you find or how can you determine how wrong a distribution is compared to the one you have? So if you think of the probability distribution of letters in the English alphabet, and then you start scouring a lot of books and calculating it, this callback leibler divergence would give you a, a good way to estimate how off what you think is the distribution of English letters in the alphabet is used in books versus what it is. This is quantized. So we take that notion of the callback leibler divergence and we wind up with the notion of relative entropy. So here, consider a state rho, and consider a state sigma. Sigma is a separable state. So somehow we can tie the notion of entanglement um, by the question of how far is the state that we've got from the state of separability. So we've gone another step. Instead of just asking, um, is a state entangled or not, we now have a concept of how far how much entanglement is built in a state. But that in itself is not enough. What we want to know is how far away is our state from the nearest separable state. Obviously, if, the nearest, if it is separable, then the nearest state is itself, and that's going to be 0. Otherwise, it, it gives a notion of how far away. And this relative entropy, in my view, is the appropriate concept for um, determining entanglement. So I, I see this as the fundamental entity to be able to determine it. I have good news for the people at the workshop um, where the von Neumann entropy is used. If you believe that the state is pure, then it reduces to the von Neumann entropy. So the relative entropy of entanglement reduces to the von Neumann entropy that's used um, in the entanglement from gravity calculations. OK, now that's the notion of separability. There's a, re uh, not related, but there's another concept that is very popular in trying to determine entanglement, um, and this is local operations and classical communication. So this goes back to the idea that there's Alice and Bob, and Alice has her operations. So Alice is doing her job, Bob is doing his job. In the Bell inequality, they don't communicate, but suppose they can communicate classically. They can mail letters to each other, emails, telephone, whatever. Then there's a notion of local operations and classical communication that's also used to determine entanglement. And then in this case, um, the idea of this local operation and classical communication, we think of as easy. We don't have to have long range entanglement. And then using this, we're able to start constructing resources for doing tasks. And one of them is entanglement of formation. So we can say, given an arbitrary state, um, sorry. If given the description of an arbitrary state, how many singlet states, so the singlet state is a maximally entangled state 
of two spin half particles, how many of those would we need to use up to build the state? Or we can ask the inverse question, given multiple copies of a state, how many of these can we make? And so um, these issues, uh, when we start to calculate that resource, we restrict parties to local operations and classical communication. So we have this notion of the relative entropy to characterize entanglement. We have the local operations and classical communication, and they're not entirely equivalent. And then there's generalizations. OK, then we have the next notion, which is about entanglement. We have um, the notion of monotonicity. So this is the idea that entanglement can be destroyed but not increased. So entanglement is somehow precious. If you make it, unless you use up more entanglement, anything you do is going to reduce the level of entanglement. So, it's, so those operations that are easy destroy it. Mathematically, this is known as a monotone. I put the definition there. But the idea of a monotone is that, um, that easy operations can only leave entanglement the same or decrease it. If we want to then talk about how much entanglement we've got, we then construct a measure. So we want a measure to satisfy this monotone property. And there's a lot of measures. I didn't even write them all down. But I just made a list there to give you an idea. There's many different measures of entanglement. And each one has pluses and minuses. And it kind of makes the field a bit of a mess. You know, If you start looking through it, should you use the measure entanglement of distillation, entanglement cost, Entanglement formation, relative entropy, distillable secret key is related to quantum cryptography, squashed entanglement, which one do you use? And so each one has advantages and disadvantages, but for, for me, um, I, th I think, I won't go into it, but I think that there has to be a special one so that entanglement is conserved during operations. You, that I, like, I like to see a conservation law of entanglement uh, that leads me to favor the relative entropy of entanglement. But depending on what you favor, there's different choices. OK, so the next thing is that we um, want to be able to detect entanglement. So given a state written down, how do we know that a state is entangled? Remember that an entangled state is a superposition with tensor product. At least two particles, say, and then what we, given the description of that state, it turns out that one way to do it is known as a partial transpose. So if we think of a matrix, you know what the transpose is. If it's two by two, you just swap your off-diagonal elements. So in a partial transpose, for this system of two spin half particles, it would be a four by four matrix, and then you do a swap. And I've just written it there. So this would be the state where we have particle and particle. We have i, j, k, l, and we've just swapped uh, the, the matrices, and it can be written in that fashion. If we do that, then we look at the eigenvalues of that new matrix. If there's any negative eigenvalue, then we know it's entangled. So one very easy test is to look for that. That's associated with the measure known as negativity. Um, and if we have two qubits, or a qubit and a qtrit, then, which is a three-level system, we have those then if we find a negative eigenvalue, it's, we have entanglement. And if we don't, we know there's no entanglement. And this is where some of the computer science comes in. I wrote a definition down there of NP hard. But if we're not dealing with the qubit qubit or the qubit qtrit, then the state, then the calculation turns out to be NP hard. It's a co computationally hard problem. OK. And then there's interesting properties for higher systems. But if we consider general bipartite entanglement, not two spin half systems, or a spin half and a spin one system, then it's very hard to know whether something is entangled. So even the question of what would happen in an experiment that characterizes a system and know if it's entangled, there's no straightforward way to, to, to have an answer. So having an entangled state and knowing it's entangled are very different from each other. OK. And then I mentioned to you about the relative entropy of entanglement. So in the relative entropy of entanglement, I don't go through the mathematical details, except to explain that it, this has meaning. That if we use that relative entropy of entanglement, then it tells us the answer to the following question. If you have n copies of a state, and you want to make m copies of another state, 
the relative entropy of entanglement will tell you the probability or the rate of manufacturing those. So the relative entropy of entanglement is very valuable. And if you believe that rho is pure, if you only deal with pure states, that reduces to the von Neumann entropy, which, as I've said over and over, is a popular one in this entanglement from gravity workshop. So this is an excellent measure to use and one that uh, satisfies excellent properties. Um, there's an entanglement associated with it. So the idea of the entanglement is the following. That suppose we have a state that's shared between Alice and Bob. Let's define the extension of the state. The extension of the state is the state with an environment, all possible environments. So imagine that Alice and Bob have two spin half particles, and then the environment could be anything. You know, it could be a magnetic field, the sun, whatever you want. Write the set of every possible state of Alice and Bob and anything else in the universe, everything else. So it, it turns out that it's mathematically well-defined, but it's probably not computable. So I'm not even saying it's hard to compute. When I say computable, it wouldn't be algorithmic. So then we have um, uh, uh, the extension to row AB in that fashion. If we then construct, we can construct an entanglement measure, which looks a bit complicated. But the entanglement measure has a very important property. It's additive. And other, so this intractable measure, not even intractable, probably non-computable measure, satisfies a property that I didn't go into before, but this is the additivity property. And so on a physical level, we want additivity. Often when we choose entanglement measures, we prefer to pick measures where we can actually calculate what they are. That seems reasonable, right, that you want to calculate it. On the other hand, if you want to deal with fundamental concepts in entanglement, then computability may not be an issue. So the, the um, additive uh, property becomes very important. This is spelled out in a paper 10 years ago by Chris Dandel and Winter. So it's a, a very nice concept. So uh, again, I like that one very much. But there are other entanglement measures, other monotones. OK, I'm going to uh, skip the entanglement witness. And I'll go straight to the monogamy and polygamy of entanglement. And so the, um, I mentioned at the beginning that one characteristic of entanglement is it's very difficult to share. It's somehow a very precious resource. If we use an entanglement measure, a suitable entanglement measure, then we can ask the following. We can say, let's consider three parties, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. So here, this would be the entanglement between Alice and the team comprising Bob and Charlie. So suppose Bob and Charlie are working together with their system. Alice has her system, and you ask about the degree of entanglement. This is the entanglement between Alice and Bob, where they're ignorant about what Charlie holds. This is the entanglement between Alice and Charlie, where they're ignorant about what Bob holds. This inequality tells us that this shared entanglement is greater than what Alice and Bob or Alice and Charlie can have added up. One key point there is the entanglement is maximized. There's one entangled bit for two spin half systems. And so if Alice and Bob maximize their entanglement, Alice and Charlie have none. So the idea here, the reason it's called monogamy, is that if Alice and Bob are completely committed, 100% share their entanglement, then Charlie's completely left out. If Alice and Charlie share their entanglement, Bob is completely left out, and then there's some bound. If in, in one of the entanglement measures known as concurrence, with the square of the concurrence, this is known as a tangle. So they use the tangle to refer to a bound on entanglement. If we take that tangle and then we purify the system, so if we take Alice and Bob and we purify, so instead of Charlie wanting to share, Charlie helps Alice and Bob, then this is the polygamy of entanglement, and that becomes a lower bound. So it turns out that there exists a duality between monogamy of entanglement and the idea of sharing with assistance. So if Charlie is no help at all, there's an upper bound. If Charlie helps, then it's a lower bound. And then they meet at that bound. And then the squashed entanglement is monogamous. And that's very important. And it's also additive. Now, um, I'm not sure. Yeah, OK. So I don't see that. In, in, the, in my thinking, the additivity is important. I'm seeing people use other measures 
of entanglement that don't satisfy additivity in addressing problems. And so it's something for those people working on it to think about. Um, OK, finally, uh, I'll tell you about tasks. So I'll mention two tasks here. One is, is known as uh, dense coding. This makes use of entanglement. So suppose you have a source of entanglement down here. And the source of entanglement gives Alice and Bob each, so Alice and Bob share a maximally entangled state. Now here, suppose that, I got, yeah, Bob wants to send information to Alice. I mentioned the Shannon information limit, the Shannon capacity. So if, if, um, that if the channel capacity only allows one bit, then Bob can only send one bit to Alice through the channel. But if Alice and Bob share entanglement, then um, Bob can send two bits down a one-bit channel. So the idea of dense coding is that whatever your Shannon capacity is for your information channel, the um, sharing of entanglement allows you to double it. That's why it's called dense coding or super dense coding. And so that's what it's showing. There's shared entanglement, and then Bob carefully tells what Alice should do. And so Bob had two bits come in, sent it to Alice, and only sent one quantum bit through the channel. So it's a quantum channel. Um, another one is the quantum teleportation uh, here. And so the idea here is that there's an entangled state over here, and that Alice wants to send to Bob one quantum bit through a classical channel. So how do you send quantum information through a classical channel? Well, you share entanglement ahead of time, and then Alice is going to measure her quantum bit against her share of that entangled one, and then broadcast to Bob classically two bits of information so he has instructions what to do with that one. And so that, I'm going to um, play this. So can I dim the lights somehow? OK, so um, here, uh, the idea is the following. I'm going to show you how the experiment's done. But this represents a nonlinear crystal that's used to generate uh, pairs of photons. And so um, oh. do I hit play? OK. So this is a nonlinear crystal, beta barium borate. Um, and here, uh, what we're going to do is to have two back-to-back -back crystals. So light will come in. It will generate a pair of photons, and then in here or here. And the idea is that the, it should be smaller than a wavelength, say. And so we don't know which crystal the pair was generated. This will generate a pair of photons that are horizontally polarized, vertically polarized. And then what comes out, it's not known which one is generated. And so this is the idea that one is rotated relative to the other. So one will generate horizontal, one will generate vertical. In case you haven't seen it, that's a photon. That's what they look like. And so the photon is going to come along from a pump. These are photons from a pump. They fly along. They go through the crystal. Some will create a pair in the first crystal. Some will create it in the second crystal. So this one creates a pair in the first crystal. And I color it blue to represent horizontally polarized. This one will not convert in the first crystal. It will convert in the second. So it will be a different color, red. And that indicates uh, horizontal. Uh, sorry, blue is horizontal, red is vertical. But in principle, you can't say which one down converted. So the green with these double moving things represents an entangled state of horizontal and vertical. So we have two horizontal photons or two vertical photons. And so this is that bipartite entangled state. We can generate them as a resource and use them to do tasks. So let's use this to do a quantum teleportation. Over here is a pump. This is the back-to-back -back crystal over here. And so out comes a pulse of light. Let's think of it as a pump photon. And the pump photon comes through. It enters the crystal. It could create a, a vertical or horizontal photons, depending where. And we don't know which one. So here's an entangled pair going forward. Out the back, we have an entangled pair. We use one photon and detect it to know we have the other. This is known as a heralded photon or triggered photon. So this is measured at a detector. And this does some random 
polarization rotation. So that went click. And now Alice has a photon. It's a quantum bit, of in, quantum bit. And she wants to transmit it to Bob. But she can't do it. There's no quantum channel. So Alice mixes her photon with her share of the entangled state. Then there's a detection. And then she sends to Bob two bits of information about what she measured. Bob is over here, and he uses the information to choose one of four settings of this polarizer rotator, and out goes the photon. And the outgoing photon is, is a complete copy of what the original but destroyed photon is. So that gives you an idea of uh, how, um, how the, uh, you turn the lights back on, <laughs> thanks. So that gives you an idea of, some idea conceptually of, of how these things work on an experimental level. So you can see I'm on the last slide, and it's getting late. Um, so here, I wanted to keep the conclusions short. But the conclusion, first of all, you know what entanglement is. It's really non-separability. And whether you have entanglement or not is a simple logical question. Is it separable? But knowing it's entangled is not straightforward at all. Um, certain types of entanglement are resourceful. So entanglement is everywhere in some sense, in the pure state sense. Entanglement is nowhere in the mixed state sense. And when we talk about entanglement, certainly in the quantum information side, we care about a certain kind of entanglement. And using it, determining the entanglement is there is hard. And when I say generically hard, I mean in a strict computer science sense. Thank you. So which of these measures that you talked about for uh, entanglement has the best chance of having an experimental realization? Oh, um, when you say experimental realization, you mean determination. So if it's a simple system, two qubits, qubit, qtrit, then um, negativity is necessary and sufficient, and the calculation is trivial. Um, after that, one of the slides I skipped was to construct a witness, which is some observable of entanglement. And then if you have good intuition, you try to pick the right operator, construct your measurement accordingly, and then if you're lucky, it will tell you you've got entanglement. If you uh, want to consider in a generic sense, then, uh, it's, um, then it's not clear how to even compute. It's not clear it's computable. So, so you, you actually demonstrated this uh, a monogam using an inequality. Uh, how, how, do you, how, how, how does one see this in some simple physical, uh, you know, this monogam? How do you see? Um, uh, how do you see that if, if, if there's a lot of entanglement, if there are three parties and there's a lot of entanglement? You mean doing an experiment? Or, or just uh, what is the intuition? I mean, why does this happen? Why, why does this monogamy happen at all? Um, so why is entanglement monotonous? Uh, I mean, monogamous? I, I don't have a good answer. I mean, it's, I just see it mathematically, so I, I don't have an intuition for it. Um, uh, OK, I'll, so I'll, I'll kind of let on what's going on in my brain. So a lot more happening than I'm telling you. Um, <laughs> so there's a concept of monogamy of entanglement, you know, that you have this entangled bit, and then you try to distribute it, and it's some special quantum property. But I'm still working through a 1957 paper of E.T. Jaynes, where I think I see a glimmer of, of appreciation of a monogamy relation, tripartite monogamy, in the context of statistical mechanics without quantumness. So I feel like I'm not going to get the, I'm not going to really understand the monogamy relation until I can get, uh, understand Jaynes' thinking from 1957. So that's why I'm holding back. But there's a standard uh, language about it, and I'm. Not that comfortable with it. I can't hear you. Uh, is it uh, possible to calculate um, a squashed entanglement for pure states? Uh, is it? Well, I don't know how to do the extension, even for pure states. Right? Because the extension, the way the extended state is, 
it's not just a state, it's a set of all states. So even with a pure state, you have to do all extensions. But maybe there's a trivial reduction I don't know about. Can you repeat the question with the mic? Uh, is uh, photon entanglement the easiest to reproduce in experiment, or charged particle like electron entanglement? Oh, um, entanglement in experiments have been done in a lot of systems. Um, so photon entanglement, entanglement between ions. So the the largest um, entangled state to date, I think, is 16 ions, 14 or 16 ions in a trap. I hear rumors that 18 or 20 is going to be seen soon. So ion traps have a huge number. If you post-select um, with photons, then uh, the published results are eight, but I know of results with at least 10 photons entangled. Um, and then if you take other systems, quantum dots, superconducting uh, qubits would be five. If you believe D-Wave's claims with quantum computers, you have over 1,000. When I say entangled, I mean uh, uh, bipartite entanglement. But I don't necessarily mean two. It could be any bipartition. OK, so if there are no further questions, let's thank Barry again.